you are here for another version of Think and Link Brand New World, uh, which is our consistent Thursday event and conversation. And I want to thank uh, Jay and Lisa for showing up and having a conversation with us today. This is going to be amazing. Um, even just in the pre-conversation, it's been good. And um, uh, I look forward to what we're going to get into um, about this. It is um, a wonderful event that we put on. If you have not been to one of our Think and Link series before, uh, we put these on every other Thursday um, at 11 o'clock uh, at um, Central Time. And uh, we as Capsule sponsor this. We are a special projects firm here in Minneapolis. And that means we look at interesting, challenging projects across a lot of these spectrums. Um, and we've had interactions with each of these two individuals and they know each other very well. Um, and we have, they have not, either of them been clients, full disclosure, uh, though we wouldn't mind um, if they did at some point down in the future. The, uh, but we have, and, and I just realized this a moment ago that uh, Jay and I came very close to that and that we had a very big Patagonia project in which uh, we worked with Avery Dennison as one of the partners on that project, and he was Avery at that time. I'd forgotten that little connection. Anyway, so Capsule is uh, Special Projects, and we are here to host this and have a wonderful conversation. It's recorded and put out in the world, and if you don't see it here, uh, subscribe, hit the little bell, and tell everybody about it so you can see what we do at Capsule. I'm going to hand it over to Kelly for the first question and for our guests to, inter to introduce themselves. And just in case Kelly has any gaps to fill. No, I, we're obviously very excited. Thank you, Aaron, to have to have you both, Lisa and Jay, with us today. And uh, we are going to dive into questions, but certainly want to hear from you, learn a little bit more about your, your background, your history, and your journey to, um, to join us here today. So Lisa, let's start with you, if you wouldn't mind, okay. um, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Jay. Sure. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Russo. Um, I head up design at Sabra Dipping Company in White Plains, New York. I've been with Sabra, actually, <laughs> I started there uh, in February of 2020. And in March, went out with COVID. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting uh, time to start a new company, needless to say. Um, but uh, prior to prior to Sabra, I was with Mondelez working with Jay. I was there about three years. And um, prior to that, I was with Pepperidge Farm, um, otherwise known as Campbell Snacks for many, many years. Um, so I've been in the design space. I was a hands-on designer um, at the beginning of my career and um, went back to graduate school. Um, to get a degree in um, design management. I was interested in the business of design. And as technology was emerging, just realized there's a lot of really good designers out there that really got the technology space. I took a, took a, a sidestep and um, really learned business. And I, as a design person, just really gravitated towards learning the business of of brands, um, representing those brands and in beautiful um, articulate ways that um, grow businesses. And um, that's what kind of fueled my fire and I've been in it ever since. So thank you for having me. Great, thank you, Lisa, thank you. Jay. Yep, my name is Jay Gouliart. I'm the uh, Global Vice President for Packaging Research Development and Quality at Mondelez International based in East Hanover, New Jersey. Uh, I'm responsible for all packaging development for all brands and all marketplaces, including uh, innovation, sustainability, productivity, and mechanical structural design. Um, I've been with Mondelez about four and a half, five years now, but prior to that, I was uh, a global group vice president for innovation at uh, Avery Dennison. I, I led the global packaging team at Unilever responsible for sustainability and design at, at Unilever. I had all brands at all markets and had lived in the Netherlands for about 15 years uh, uh, on, in those two roles. Um, prior to that, I was the uh, vice president of packaging at General Mills in Minneapolis. Uh, before that, the global director of packaging for Coca-Cola at uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Um, I was a senior manager at uh, Anheuser-Busch in, in charge of integrated product and process development. And I started my career as an advanced air-to-air -air missile designer uh, at McDonnell Douglas Aerospace in St. Louis, Missouri, designing missiles that you hang on the wings of an F-15 and experiments <laughs> that flew in the Bay of the Space Shuttle and satellites that uh, were part of the Star Wars program. So kind of a, a very CPG intense background with uh, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a beginning in the aerospace industry, but I'm yeah. a mechanical engineer uh, with a master's degree in uh, engineering and technology management. Um, and I'm the co-author of one book uh, with Seth Godin and a number of other people called The Big Move uh, that we published back in the mid 2000s, I think it was. But that's a little bit about me. Oh, Great wow. to be here today. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Jay. You're both just such impressive backgrounds from you both and it runs the gamut, Jay, for sure. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, thank you both. I'm going to jump right in. Um, uh, we have a lot we'd love to cover today, and hopefully we can get through most of this um, um, so we can hear some perspectives from you, uh, certainly in the CPG space and the packaging space. But I'd like to start with, um, and we'd had some previous conversations around um, consumers and their, their more concerted effort um, to learn and understand when it comes to food, certainly, where it's grown, how is it grown and processed and then ultimately brought to market. And this is when we talk about supply chain and transparency and how are brands and organizations marketing to or really ultimately building trust with consumers through transparent practices, um, again, supply chain and through marketing. Would love to hear from both of you if you could share some perspectives within your organizations or even historically um, how what types of practices have you put into place through design through marketing to really bring these um, approaches and this transparency to light uh, Lisa can we start with you and then Jay sure. your thoughts so it's a great question um, you know I think you know my philosophy is always about honesty and transparency. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting because I now work with a clear tub, right? So <laughs> um, doing so, it's really about enabling consumers to really see what's in it when possible, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, with Sabra, you know, many people truly believe, which it is, um, our products are designed by a chef. You know, they're, they're manufactured, yes, but they're designed by a chef. And um, we're very close to understanding what consumers are looking for through, you know, navigating trends and, you know, what, what they like to serve, regardless of their, their culture or ethnicity or geographic location, what have you. It's really understanding what they like to eat. And so um, first and foremost, it's, you know, it's really selection through the eyes. And that's always been, you know, what I love about working in food is it's, it, there's just so many beautiful ways to articulate food, mm -hmm. even the most benign, you know, I re remember working on fresh bread in, um, uh, when I worked for Pepperidge Farm, and it was just we were in a transparent bag, and um, you know the thought, um, the thought process of what's involved in the creation of our products. Um, how do I articulate that? Because boy, is it, it's it's um, they sweat the details. You know, the people behind the brands that I've worked for truly sweat the details. And it's like, as a designer, how do I articulate that? How do I really give um, the knowledge and pay homage to the knowledge that's been put into these brands and do so in a, in a beautiful way that will captivate people on shelf and give us a point of difference? So for me, it's really about kind of looking and digging and diving into how it, how is the best way I can articulate this proposition. And even if it's, you know, filled with this and filled with that and, you know, jacked up on sugar or not or whatever it is, it's just, right. you know, food, the, uh, the visual interest of food is what I love to 
be involved in and represent. That's wonderful. Be beautiful story of how design for being designed forward with how you bring that message to your consumer. So thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Jay, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very timely question for Mondelez. We have completed two pilots uh, at Mondelez looking at using blockchain technologies to uh, talk to our consumers and share with our consumers the provenance of some of the sustainable ingredients that we are striving to achieve in, in our portfolio. We have two big programs, one focused on wheat and one focused on cocoa. cocoa. Uh, and so we have a cocoa life program as well as a harmony wheat program. And recently we ran a, a pilot in North America on Triscuit where consumers could uh, click on the QR code and it will take them to a website and, and show the uh, consumer how the sustainably harvested wheat is produced, talk about the farmers that actually produced it, uh, can connect the brand very, very closely uh, with the consumer and with our agenda on the sustainability front. And um, before that, we did a similar pilot in, in, uh, in Europe with our Lou brand of, of biscuits, uh, where we use the same technology, blockchain technology, uh, working with a, a third party to, to help us in our traceability and understand how, how our communications and how these pilots impacted our consumers' perception of the brands. But we are very focused on not only sustainable packaging, but sustainable ingredients. And, and we think this is a great platform using the QR code or mm -hmm. uh, NFC tags or, or other types of technology to engage consumers with the brand and with the story that's, that's really, really impactful uh, when, you're, when you're doing the right thing when it comes to getting the right ingredients into the products that they're purchasing. That's impressive, right? So this yeah. area now of technology, of storytelling, of design, it runs the spectrum and it gives a holistic view to the consumer of the product and the, the brand behind it. Thank you, Jay and Lisa, mm -hmm. for that perspective. That's great. Yeah. Are you seeing new consumer behaviors out there as it relates to sustainability? Or is this, do you think this is hitting a tipping point where people are making decisions based on the responsibility of the brands? Um, is that showing up more in, in research or in conversations internally, or are there other things around that? Jay, you want to take that one as far as? Yeah, I, I can. I can talk to that. I, I, you know, sustainability has been around for quite a while, and as you said, we we may be at a tipping point. But I, I think I think it's almost generational, Aaron. I think you know the new consumers entering, uh, you know, the marketplace today are extremely focused on sustainability, and they are making decisions about what brands to purchase based on the sustainability, what they perceive to be the sustainability credentials of those brands and of those products. Uh, they're not willing yet to spend more money on those brands or those products, but, and they're not willing to compromise on, on quality and taste and experience. Uh, and so it's, it's really imperative that we deliver on all the elements that a, that a consumer expects and, and, and deliver on all the, uh, uh, the desired consumer experiences that they need. But uh, it is becoming much more important. And even through the, through the length of the COVID situation that we've been in for the past 18 months, we still see continued interest and in, 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 uh, drive for the consumer to want more sustainable products. And we believe that coming out of the, the uh, pandemic, uh, there will be even more uh, of an of a, uh, incentive for consumers to uh, continue to desire those types of products. I think by the time we get to 2025, it'll be the ticket to entry for any consumer packaged good. If we don't have sustainability credentials, uh, our, our ability to sustain a business in the marketplace will be very limited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very elegant. Lisa, do you have a perspective on that or yeah. what you can see at Sabra? Um, you know, there, um, with Sabra, uh, again, it, it's, it's, about being as transparent as possible. And there's a number of initiatives um, being done uh, to, to make our package uh, recyclable. Um, it is recyclable. We just have to kind of tweak a few things in order for the full system to be recyclable. Um, I was mentioning we're working on some adhesives and things like that to enable um, the full package to be recyclable. Um, you know, it's also what our customers demand. 
you know, and, and, um, you know, they want the, uh, the products that are in their stores uh, to be recyclable or, and or, you know, they've got their initiatives as well. So the stores, the, the products that are within their stores have to meet a certain threshold. And so, um, you know, how do you do that? It's a question, you know, I have the same, same sort of challenge in my own home, you know, where, you know, I could have a tendency to be a bit of a dumpster diver when I see something that should be recycled that's not, you know, and I, I'm constantly picking things out of bins to make sure that they're in the right bin and uh, make sure that we're doing the right thing just on a micro scale. But when you think about um, the macro scale and all of the things that you're putting out into the world, um, how, how um, just going through the full, you know, the full cycle of, you know, what you have, how you produce it, where you produce it, by what means, it's, it's, it's staggering the amount of opportunity that we have to, to really um, do the right thing. But it's expensive, and as Jay mentioned, you know, transferring that to um, having consumers pay more hasn't quite quite happened. So I would say, as a, I don't think we're at a tipping point. I think it's just become um, table stakes. Like that's mm -hmm. just what people expect mm -hmm. is that yeah. you are there. It just yeah. it requires, from the company standpoint, it requires investment. It requires focus, and you know, many of the brands that I'm attracted to, you know, that it's part of their ethos. They wouldn't mm -hmm. have it any other way. It's not something that they're adding on to do the right thing. It's just part of what they're about. Right. right. They're designed from that way from the beginning. Yeah. Correct. Right. Because we've heard the term big, the greenwashing. And are there, is there really something, you know, solid and fundamental behind the brand and what the, the initiatives they're, they're taking? That are really a part of that ethos, Lisa. To your point, so it's it's interesting to see how that continues to evolve. And you're right; I do think it is generational. Jay, it's a good point, and two though, in terms of the viewpoint. Did you have something to add to that? Yes, I was going to say I do think that consumers are confused. We we have not done a good job as an industry in teaching and communicating with consumers and educating them in this space. And it's so easy to be misled or have a, a perception that's not correct and do something that you think is actually helping the environment but in the end you're actually not helping the environment and you're degrading the environment and it's it's you know it's it's a very 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 complex topic because it's not just about waste it's about global warming potential it's about the social elements it's about you know, the with the water usage a land usage so it's mm -hmm. it's it's got many many different sort of uh, arms that are reaching out into different parts of the world. And it's, it's uh, like I said, I've designed missiles and space shuttles and those types of things. And none of those are as complex as the sustainability issues that we're facing today. I mean, we have, we have the, wow. you know, the future of the planet in our hands, guys, and we really have right. to make a difference. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the rocket that scientists. Way, yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's impactful for sure. No, yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah. thank you both. Um, I want to shift gears really now to, to design. Um, obviously, you're both both vocal advocates um, for the critical role that design plays, really in building unique value, you know, creating those extraordinary products, certainly, and then the content in terms of how we talk about those products um, with consumers. Um, curious, and we've talked a little bit about entry to market and how those entry barriers have been historically they were down and i'm curious if you when you think about in light of the pandemic are those barriers to entry in the marketplace still down has that shifted at all are you seeing a shift and then along with that second follow-up question you know what impact does the role of designers and innovators play in driving success within the organization so sort of a two-pronged question we'll start with the entry to, to market, are those barriers down? Do you think it's still easy, these emerging brands coming in left and right? Um, Lisa, I wanna start with you and then Jay would love to hear your thoughts and then we'll talk about the role innovation and design plays in success. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I know in, um, 
uh, again, I'm learn I'm new to the fresh market, mm -hmm. um, working um, in fresh dips and spreads. Uh, and what's been really interesting is, you know, hummus is having, you know, a hot moment where, you know, we are um, the leader in the category. And by being the leader of, in a category, in a small-ish but growing category, there's a lot of uh, new brands coming into market that are very interesting, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of their aesthetic. Um, you know, some, it's about, it's about origin. You know, it's it's all about you know. In the beginning, there is a chickpea, you know, um, and and others. It's you know region. It's kind of like where where it's from. Others is about sort of the um, uh, what's in what's in it. You know, what kind of flavor it is. There's sort of alpha focus on that, and others are about you know how do I use it? How, what do I show? You know, and having conscious choices about you know, what is it that I show? And um, part, of, part of the answer to the question, I think, is about being confident about what you are. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason you're in business. There's a reason that your brand and your product um, is, a, is, a, is a leader in the category. It's a great, great product. So it's a question of like, don't always follow everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you do get lots of people coming to your desk saying, this one's doing that, we got to do that. And this one's doing that, we got to do that. And it's just, you can be all things to all people. But at the end of the day, you know, it's like living with yourself. And, um, you know, what is it that you stand for and really kind of digging in and saying this is what I stand for and these this is a non-optional in terms of being what everybody else is so you know as as a designer um and we were talking about that before we we got on it's just you know I, my whole office is filled with packages and beautiful things that people create I learn from everybody or at least I hope to I, I feel like it's a bad day if I don't um there's so many interesting considerations that we can make. It's just what are the right ones for us and being very conscious and confident that those are the right ones for us to make. Um, and so remind me again about the second part of the question. I think you, and I think you answered at least to a degree. And, and it was really just what, how can design and, you know, being just, just design thinking in general, how can that help drive success within your organization. So innovation yeah. design, and I think you touched on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, there's lots of white papers around design thinking and, you know, what that means. But I, I really, I kind of rooted in, in being empathetic to our consumer. What are they going through? Mm -hmm. What are they looking for that we can help support? Um, with our product, but at the same time, it be comes down to the aesthetics of how we look. What um, what do we need to be in order to really support them in um, this search for a uh, food solution? Mm -hmm. That's great. No, thank you. So having that North Star and letting that be your guiding, your, that's, that's guiding you, your competitive advantage and not just following whatever trend. Yeah, is. you know, again, it's like right. just working with so many different agencies and they've mm -hmm. taught me so much about just um, really understanding the consumer and what are their challenges? What are barriers? You know, really listening to their day and, and how they live and what they're up against and being a solution um, to offset a need. That's great. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for sharing your thoughts there. Jay. Yeah, I, I don't have any data on, on this, but I do think that most likely the barriers to entry have not gotten any higher. In fact, they might have been lowered a bit because mm -hmm. a lot of these new products get introduced to consumers via uh, online 
yep. systems and consumers today are much more comfortable shopping online than they were 18 months ago. With right. Most of us have been forced to embrace that, that uh, channel, whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think that it's probably easier today for you know, a, a, a new brand, a, a new entre an entrepreneur who's got a great idea to get out there and get some exposure with consumers who are, are searching the, in the internet for, for different types of products. And I do think that, you know, when I look at design, I think of design, not just of the graphics or the shape of the package, but also the product. And I think design plays a huge role in the design of the product today. And, and a lot of these entrepreneurs are designing products either to deliver against a specific purpose that they have in mind that they believe in, or because they want to solve a specific problem that a, a, a small group of consumers uh, need products to help them solve. And mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a very opportunistic time for entrepreneurs to get into the market because we're, we're all out there on our screens probably more hours a day than we ever have been. And we, are, we, we, we've been trained and sort of encouraged to shop online. So the ability for an entrepreneur to get a new product out there is really high. Now, can they get on the first page of the Amazon uh, site? Can they, can they sustain the growth of that product over time is another question. But I do think that it's, it's pretty easy today for people to, to, to launch a new product um, in, in the world. It's, it's uh, not only here mm -hmm. in the U.S., but in China and in Europe and other sure. parts of the world. Mm -hmm. sure. No, thank you. And the look of the the look of the products, the look of the packaging has so much influence. You know, yeah. just something looking cool. You have no idea what it tastes like, but just something looking interesting can drive purchase, right? So it's just, um, you know, picking it up for any number of reasons, taking a shot on your phone, uploading it to social media, and saying, "Hey, I found this." We have no idea what it tastes like, but thought it was cool looking and, you know, starting a tribe of people that are interested in, in that brand. It's amazing what you end up finding out from our consumers and what they say, um, yeah. just by being attracted to something that they see in store. That's a great point. Yeah. The way of testing, you're right. What it, what is how, when I'm scrolling through the myriad of brands that are, that are trying to consume my, my, my social media feed, what attracts me, but then it goes back to the point, Jay, the point you're making it has to be a great product there for it to be sustainable mm -hmm. and to have long, you know, longevity in the market. Yes. I may be attracted. I may purchase, but will I be a repeat purchaser? Mm -hmm. So, right. So it's an, it is an interesting time. No, thank uh, you both for, for sharing. I'm going to, going to add Kelly that, um, you know, entrepreneurs have a huge advantage over some of our, our the big consumer packaged goods companies because they have no capital in the ground and, and they can choose a very, very unique package that uh, Lisa and I would only dream of using on our manufacturing lines. And if, if we wanted to convert our lines to run those packages, we'd probably have to invest another couple of hundred million dollars in order right. to run those products. So I think it's, you know, they, they, they certainly have the ability to get into market quickly with, with new and innovative packaging and shapes and sizes that, you know, those of us who operate you know, big, big supply chains and big manufacturing systems have a difficult time sort of achieving in, in the short term. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. The, um, yeah, especially the entrepreneurs, it's a fascinating thing that's happened in the last decade for food entrepreneurs and how many have shown up and the new types of ventures and right. It's been, it's been an interesting competitive landscape for sure. Um, switching gears a little bit to digital and the role digital has impacted uh, or how much it's come into your life and how much you've noticed um, and talked about it. And I bring up a thing that we recently were, um, was put in front of us that a, um, someone, uh, a non-fungible token around uh, that had uh, purchased a, um, they had purchased, what was it? A Coca-Cola puffy coat that you could wear in any of your avatar characters online. And the price for this Coca-Cola <clears throat> puppy coat um, was five hundred and seventy-five thousand um, dollars, and uh, which just it's 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 you know those of us who've and all of you who have been around on the planet long enough, you want to look at these things and try to find an explanation, but then it almost begs like I, there there can't be there's I mean how many billions of dollars do you have to have to justify five hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in a digital 
um, puffy coat um, that's branded Coca-Cola. Um, not to give a nod to your former employer from many years ago, Jay, but I'm curious about digital and what you've seen in that. Um, has it had a negative or a positive impact? Um, have you dipped your toe? Have, have you you gone deep on it? Do you have TikTok accounts? You don't have to answer that. I'm just kidding. Um, but what are the things that you found that are interesting around digital as it relates to food? Jay, you want to take that one? Really yeah, I th I th complex th one. Yeah, I sit, sit in research and development, and and you know we have embraced digital wholeheartedly, and we believe it's it's a great opportunity for us to experiment. Uh, to a greater detail, to to try things uh, in using modeling and simulation tools prior to actually going to a production line. So we can we can run yeah. many many different simulations. We can test many different products. We can design many different types of packaging, and, and we can we can we can do that all in the digital space. We can actually use VR technology and AR technology to put those those different ideas and co-collaborate with consumers to get their feedback instantly on those designs and on those new products. So I think it's 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 something that the the pandemic has has sort of accelerated for us at, at Mondelez. We're, we're moving very quickly into that space. Digital marketing has been around for a while, and we've we've made some great strides in digital marketing, but uh, you know, virtual R&D or digital R&D is a relatively new space for us. You know, and we, we truly believe that it's, it's the future of R&D and that uh, you know, the future uh, research and development associates that, that come into our company will need to have those types of skills and capabilities in order to be successful. It, it allows us to get into market quicker. It, get, it allows us to produce and, and develop higher quality products and packages that really resonate with consumers. And, and it allows the consumer to participate in those, in those design uh, activities with us. So we, we, we are embracing it. We're, we're relatively young in our journey on the R&D side, but our, our, our marketing side is much more mature in the, in the digital space. Nice. Lisa? Yeah, we had done some work together, Jay, a couple of years back around you know, the digital uh, shelf sets that we had built and the whole VR capability. We had um, a room and um, that we had, you know, all of our customer shelf sets built so that when we were evaluating design, we put them right into the in-store experience so that that wasn't something that, um, you know, we had to do physically. Uh, so we were able to get sort of that intel way upstream. Um, I, I found that that project uh, to build that um, really rewarding because you were able to build not only shelf sets, but you were able to build um, them by retailer um, point of sale and really go down the aisle and have the have the consumer experience um, and and make changes before you wish you did <laughs> um, prior. So that was a really uh, rewarding experience. The other thing is that, um, you know, certainly for packaging and, and my experience in packaging, you know, the package is one piece. But as I've gotten in more and more categories, you know, understanding, you know, lighting conditions, understanding um, neighboring brands, understanding, um, you know, placement. And, you know, right now, um, understanding like coolers and sort of like how those kind of go back and they're dark and shadow and you know they're next to delis many times and so how do you it's really important to recreate you know the good then shiny and polished but it's also really important to build in your challenges into those environments as well so you could really see you know shopping back on an aisle um you know, wow, if this is really in the shadow, no one's going to see it at all. No one's going to think that, you know, maybe we ran out of stock. So it's taking the good and the bad of the environments and building that into um, your evaluations. That's a great point. Interesting. Very interesting. Huh. Digital transformation. It's funny. I, we, we've, we've, we, I think, 12 months ago where we're using digital transformation regularly in conversations and now we're hearing it's no longer a transformation it's here 
So mm-hmm. how are we embracing right. it? How are we utilizing it to optimize? Um, right. so that's interesting. Thank you both. Uh, another gear shift. I want to talk about culture um, because we've, and this is getting these perspectives across industries, across verticals. It's, it's quite fascinating to hear how organizations Number one, how do you define it? You know, define culture, and and we know it's cultivated differently within um, different size organizations, different types of organizations, but it's such a defining component of building authenticity. Now, I know with a with a you know companies the size of Mondelez, global company, and how does culture translate across different countries and you know different different cultures? There, would love to hear again though from both of you. Um, how would you describe your culture, you know, the, within your organization and how are you maintaining it right now? We're in this virtual environment. We're not necessarily in a physical office space. Um, just curious to hear both from you, what you're seeing, what you've seen historically, and maybe what you're seeing now that's different and perhaps better, better way of connecting. Uh, Jay, let's start with you, please. Yeah, that's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very, very interesting and appropriate question at this time in the pandemic. I, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I've had the opportunity to, and been very fortunate to work at, at many very big companies that have very diverse cultures, I guess you would call them. Uh, you know, Coca-Cola is much different than a Unilever, different than uh, an Avery Dennison. But, I, you know, the one thing that I, I didn't anticipate when I joined Mondelez that I found out after I did join, and Lisa and I have talked about this many times. Sorry about the siren in the background. I don't know if you can hear it or not. But well, I live they're in coming for you. Yeah. They're coming for you. <laughs> there's no fire in the building, and we don't have any floods here in the Upper West Side, so there's uh, no, no problems. But one time, Lisa and I had talked a lot about was that the culture is really it's built by the people who work at the company and and, you know i what i found when i joined mondelez that that i never would have guessed in my life is that mondelez has a very caring culture and and what i mean about that 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 people really care about one another and they want each other to succeed and they work really hard to support each other which is which was very refreshing i mean i like i said i never had anticipated that and it, it's not just in North America; it's everywhere you travel the globe for Mondelez. And it, I think it it mm. must have something to do with the type of people that we have brought into the company. It may have something to do with the, the types of brands that we we have in our portfolio. Um, you know, they're very caring and joyful and, and tender brands. But I, I think if you know, if one word to describe the Mondelez culture would be care. And during the pandemic, it has served us very well because people reach out to one another. We're very empathetic. We, 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 we touch base as often as we possibly can. We're very sensitive to um, the differences in, in stress levels that people are seeing. I get on phone calls with people where three dogs are running around and two kids are pulling on mom's hair and somebody <laughs> wants something out of the microwave and you know, there's a school lesson that has to be completed in the next 15 minutes. And, you know, we, we accept that and we embrace that. And, and, you know, we, we, we understand that life is different for each and every one of us. And I think that that caring culture, that fact that, you know, we, we have empathy for one another has, has paid us dividends during and throughout the pandemic. That's great to hear. Empathy. Mm-hmm. That seems to be the, I mean, we have to have that for each other and within mm-hmm. relations. So yes, Jay, thank you for sharing that. Lisa. Yeah, uh, I'm looking back, um, you know, at all my, all my roles in, you know, CPG, especially, um, I would say the same thing, Jay, around um, the way you felt at work. Um, for Mondelez especially, it was one where I left a month before the pandemic hit, but I had been working on the global business since I started. So I got very used to um, having my headset on and speaking Mm -hmm. to um, one region early in the morning, talking to another region in the afternoon and talking to another late at night. And, um, you know, that just was the job and uh the caring culture um i'm i must look for (laughs) you know when i join organizations it's really important to me that i am with uh the right people Mm -hmm. um that 
that not only care for each other, but care about the brands that they represent. I found that at Mondelez too, that, you know, there was um, uh, uh, a, you know, a young culture coming in and, you know, they're right out of school and they're working away. Um, and they might not have had the experience to articulate what they were looking for or looking to do. But when you really um, kind of interviewed them and um, listened to sort of the suite of brands that they held very precious to them as people, um, the reasons why were they really resembled themselves. You know, there is this whole sort of the brands I use really represent me. And um, I found that luckily the companies that I've worked for and the people that I've, I've related to the most are the people that take it that personally. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really a reflection of me. I'm not just coming to work. This is a reflection of how much I care. Mm -hmm. Right. And it ultimately is, a re it's reflected in the work that's done when you can tell someone it, it, you know, not only does the brand resonate and, and what the brand stands for resonates, but, but you're right, the culture then sort of underscores, we understand you, we understand that this is work, but it's also life and how do you find that balance? And so it's an interesting, so no, thank you. It's uh, certainly a topic that is timely uh, right now. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. Of course. Yeah, yeah, I love this. This is, um, it brings about conversations of other brands in other categories and and brands that you admire um, either ones you've worked for in the past or I think more importantly the other ones you're seeing adjacent or outside of your category that you've looked at and said I really admire what they're doing um, I'm curious from each of your perspectives what brands are doing some interesting things through what you're seeing um, Jay you want to start with that one yeah, I, I mean, I'll be selfish and, and use a brand that I had supported in my past life. But I think when I when I think about brands that are doing a really good job, I think about Dove and, and the campaign for beauty that they launched many years ago. Uh, yeah. the, the thread is continuing throughout the development of that communication yeah. with the consumer. And I think they're just doing a, a phenomenal job recognizing that we, we all don't look like models. We all, aren't, all of our bodies aren't shaped the same, uh, mm -hmm. but our products, Unilever Dove products are designed for you. And I think they, they have done a fantastic job. And I was with Mondo, with, with Unilever when they kicked off that campaign. And I think Sylvia Lagnado was leading the, the charge at that point in time for the Dove brand. But I, the fact that they've consistently sort of communicated that message to the consumer and connected with them in a very authentic way and recognizing the differences and diversity that exists in you know, all different forms, whether it's shape, size, color, age, they, they've really allowed the Dove brand to, to span all of that diversity and serve all of their consumers very well. So I think they've, they've done a fantastic job on the design side from a communication standpoint, uh, but also from the graphic standpoint and a product standpoint. I think that it's a, yeah, it's a fantastic yeah. example. It is, that yeah. is a wonderful one. I wouldn't have thought of that. And that is, a, I mean, it's just such a, I've had many conversations with beauty brands that struggle with breaking through that cultural barrier um and in literally saying it well we can't show not beautiful people and it like seriously you can't show average people um you can't just show the people that are actually using the product we're that shallow as a population i think you can do that i think we can break through and they've proven that i mean it's it's epic it's it's as epic as apple bringing design to the world and, and having people see design and I don't think everybody fully gets what they've done, what what barrier they've broken, really, mm -hmm. yet. You know what I mean? It isn't completely out there. It's people go, wait a minute, we don't have to just show supermodels, right? Because honestly, people don't want to look like supermodels. Like, eat something, kids. <laughs> Come on, right? Anyway, Lisa, <laughs> do you have a yeah. friend or a story out there? Love yeah, um, you know, there's a couple that I, I think about you know, one of my favorite sort of foundational brands that um, I just 
wholeheartedly believe in is Patagonia. And I, I know that that's come up a lot of times, but it's just, they really live their truth. And mm -hmm. I just, I love the act of, you know, I would, I would love to be in that boardroom around just, or in their innovation space or whatever it is. And it's just, you know, the um, calling foul on something that didn't subscribe to the truth that they live. And because I'm sure that there's, there's um, brands, there's ideas uh, and uh, things that they could do, um, but it's like saying no you know, and having the, um, having the uh, strength and the confidence to say, no, that's not right for our brand. Um, th that's sort of, um, as a company, I, I really love the, just the, the confidence of saying no, you know, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. There's other, there's other um, categories that um, I really appreciate, and they're doing many different things, like one category um, around denim, and denim is a huge contaminant in the world for many reasons, whether it's the creation of or the disposing of or the what have you, but there's many brands that are sort of targeting, um, whether it's you know, there's a bin in the front of their store where you bring any brand denim in and they'll take it. Mm -hmm. And that you there's some version of a reward for doing so. Um, there's other brands that are sort of taking that denim and then making something else. So the whole upcycling bit of uh, creating something with what you bring back. Uh, that's a conversation, you yeah. know, that's a yeah. conversation with a consumer that's much different than here's my stuff, I'm putting it on a shelf and you buy that that's, yeah. that's a, a reciprocity. That's, um, mm. that's a personal conversation of having that with your consumer. And, and I, I love the ability to um, the idea of the ability to, to, to connect that on that deep of a level, yeah. um, taking on these causes. So yes, the the product is denim, but you know it's really about um, trying to minimize the contamination of what that product does and how much denim there is in the world. You know, a lot of people don't realize it. They're looking at the aesthetics of it, but the creation of it and um, how to take on how to take on some of those causes in interesting ways. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I find the whole thing really interesting. It's like, I want to yeah. try it on for size and, yeah. and see. Right. The, um, yeah, you've, of course, hit a, a hot button for us. We, we can talk about Patagonia for a couple of hours um, and tell you all kinds of wonderful stories of what it's like to be in that organization and culturally mm -hmm. and otherwise. And and uh, and there's, there's, a, there's one anecdote that I want to, convey because you'll both appreciate this one. Um, Patagonia the company and Patagonia the brand are the same thing. And there's not many brands that can say that, right? That they can actually say that and not many brands and not, and not that it is said enough or is, you know, is showcased enough as a thing, right? The corporate veil, which unfortunately in public companies, you have that environment where you have to answer to shareholders. And they don't have to answer to shareholders, but they do have to answer to customers mm -hmm. um, and customers as consumers and customers and to the planet. And really, they answer more to the planet and to being responsible than anything else. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it is, it's, it's fascinating how true, and I would tell you that, that what you see on the outside is what's going on on the inside. It's the same thing. Um, they are selling products that, you know, you don't need, but marketing and design create desire, right? So they create um, a want in something you don't really need. So it's by its nature, not good for the planet, right? In the case of what you're doing in food, we still do need it. We need the calories to survive as human beings. But in fashion, we don't need anywhere near as much as we have. Um, it's very abundant, um, and they recognize that. Um, so, and it's they're just true to it, which is elegant. It's a beautiful thing. 
Um, anyway, Amazing. I could talk for hours on that. So we better not. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know Kelly. I can tell when you brought up had a good Kelly. Like, oh no, 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 no. Because oh, no, <laughs> oh here we they go. Are a, a, they they come to, they come into conversation on a regular basis when it comes to recognizing yeah. who stays true to the brand and the company and and right walking the walk. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask this question. We, we, we keep, we're referring to design, the importance of design, and we've talked about design thinking, but what I'd love to dig a little bit deeper, just your personal perspectives on what, what does that mean to you? How do you define design thinking? And then what does it mean to you in terms of how you work? How do you apply that mindset on a day-to-day basis at both Mondelez and at, and at Sabra? Jay, I'll start with you. If you could share your thoughts, please. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to me, design thinking in, in a nutshell is, is making, sure, making sure that you always can keep the consumer front and center with everything that you do mm-hmm. um, and, and, and ensure that you're delivering against the desired experience that that consumer wants in the end. Um, it, it's about sort of getting really close and intimate with the consumer and developing a deep understanding of, of what their needs are or their unmet needs are today. And, and using that information and those insights and, and taking those insights and creating innovations that can deliver against them. So it's, and it's about, it's about prototyping, it's about testing, it's about experimentation, it's about not, not not being fearful of, of putting things in front of consumers and, and, and interacting with them and getting their feedback very frequently, testing and learning often as you possibly can before you get into the marketplace, taking that feedback to heart and, and doing the right things for the consumer and the brand. Uh, and then sort of maintaining a high degree of curiosity um, mm-hmm. to, to look outside your category and look outside your brands to see what's going on in the rest of the world and, and, and then trying to understand how you can translate what you see uh, to help you meet those consumer needs that aren't, aren't being met today. So that's what I think, I mean, there, there are all kinds of different charts and graphs and flows for, for design thinking, but in, the, in I think at the core is the consumer. And, and that's the thing that, that's the person who pulls out their credit card or takes right. the, you know, the few, bits of change that they have in their pocket and they lay it on the table to purchase the products that you've developed for them. So I think you know, we, we, we need to serve the consumer. Uh, and, and by the consumer, I just don't mean the person themselves, but their entire sort of ecosystem around them. Mm-hmm. So the consumer, the planet, the world we live in, because mm-hmm. all of those things are important to consumers today. Right. I need to- Beautifully, beautifully articulated. Thank you. And, and I'm curious, Jay, too, if you could share how you apply that, obviously, you from, from building rockets or design <laughs> innovation, that side of it, to, to now, <laughs> how have you applied that mindset? I mean, uh, building rockets is probably a different uh, consumer than what, what I, <laughs> my, my consumer then was the U.S. Navy or the U.S. Army or, or the Air Force at the time, so it's a little different animal. But I, I, I think how I, I apply design thinking is, you know, I, I make a point to engage with consumers as often as I possibly can. Um, mm-hmm. Even go back as far as my career at Unilever, whenever I would travel to a part of the world, I would carve out a day or two just to immerse myself in the lives of the consumer. Uh, I, would, I would show up in their homes and sit down with them and drink a cup of tea or a cup of coffee with them, leave mm-hmm. my shoes outside, try to understand how, 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 how they live their day. I mean, did, mm-hmm. I, I was talking to somebody the other day about um, emerging economies and how do we serve those that might be at the bottom of the pyramid. And I said that the best way to do that is go out there and walk in their shoes for a couple of days or a week just to try to understand you know, what they have to go through in order to survive. And I think that, that's developing, again, empathy, consumer empathy mm-hmm. uh, is, is extremely important. And I, I don't, I think it's hard to do by reading reading reports or working with a, an insights agency in, in China and then reading the, their output and trying to translate that into something. I, I really believe that firsthand experiences and, and, and sitting down with those consumers is extremely important. So I, like I said, I, 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 I've maintained that behavior throughout my career uh, of spending days with consumers whenever I get a chance to get into the marketplace. 
That's been fantastic. I mean, d- data certainly has a role to play, but holistically, it's it's really it's understanding the human being, yeah. what are their needs and wants and and desires. And thank you, Jay. That's a beautiful story. Thank you, Lisa. Let's hear. Yeah, I I mean, all I can do is agree, um, and you know, there's there's uh, there's um, when I get asked that question, it's really interesting because it's just the way my brain is wired. And it, mm-hmm. so to to unbundle the way your brain is wired and, and say it in a statement is a little difficult. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, like uh, like Jay mentioned, you know, going into a different country and, and um, understanding how uh, what is life to them? It made me think about um, when we were working together on um, the sustainability initiative, and we were we were looking at um, some of these challenges in in com- in third world countries of um, how difficult it is to recycle something. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the infrastructure in there. So so how does a brand come in and talk sustainability Mm -hmm. to to people that want to do the right thing? There is no place to put it. They have trouble even just getting the garbage out of their streets, never mind put into the right places. I mean, it's, I think in that regard, being empathetic to that situation, um, it's like, my gosh, how hard that must be. And, you know, in other countries, it's a little, it's more advanced and and easier, but it's it's understanding um, uh, who you're talking to, what they're dealing with, um, what they're, what their desires are, but also what their challenges are. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, something like sustainability in some of these countries, you know, that's a government issue. That's, um, you know, that's um, needing funding, like you wouldn't believe. And, and here mm-hmm. it is like, we're gonna put a sticker on something. You can't be, you can't be out of touch to say, okay, we're going to just put that sticker on it and everything is going to be fine right. without thinking about that person that, that doesn't, you know, might have to walk to a bin five miles you know, to just do right. the right thing. It just, you know, you have to be thinking about those things and who you're talking right. to, what they're going through. And for us as a brand on any brand that we've worked on, it's, it's continually continually um, trying, iterating, trying again, seeing if you got it right, not Mm -hmm. just assuming that you did. So prototyping, um, trying to figure out um, what are those nuances to really um, get the consumer to do what you want them to do, whether it's purchasing, recycling, Mm -hmm. you know, ingesting, who knows what it is, but it's marketing to them through those nuances that um, need attention absolutely yeah. not making assumptions it's the biggest right. mistake brands make they Agreed. assume they know who they're talking to marketing to it's not about that understanding a human being thank you both yeah that was uh that was wonderful and uh this itself has been an incredible session uh, we've talked rocket science we've talked blockchain <laughs> We've talked design thinking systems. Um, yeah, and I love that we concluded on the complexity of the system itself and understanding the broader food system and how to, I mean, just to get your head around it, and understand the complexity the complexities of it is important for all of us, and certainly all the way down to the average consumer. Um, Jay and Lisa, thank you for doing this, for taking the time to share your insights with our audience. This has been wonderful. I look forward to seeing comments and shares in, uh, in the video form later on. And um, I look forward to seeing you hopefully in person someday again. Um, I hope so. Life allows that. Um, so thank you again for spending time with us on the stage. And I look forward to seeing you in the future. Yes. 
Lisa, thank you for thank having thank me. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Likewise. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.